Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Tom Field and I'm going to talk to you about the nervous system and neurotransmission. This video lecture may be new information to some of you, it may be old information to others of you. Some of you may need to view this more than once. Some of the information in here is quite technical, but is very important to your understanding of the biopsychosocial model. What is the biopsychosocial model? It's a method of assessing and conceptualizing mental health symptoms. There are biological factors we think about, psychological factors, and social factors. Biological factors include a person's genetics and epigenetics, the central nervous system and neurotransmission, brain networks, such as default mode, the peripheral nervous system, pain and muscle movement, neuroplasticity and adaptation that you see in substance use and trauma, the endocrine system and hormone function, and uh, the secretion of cortisol, adrenaline, oxytocin, melatonin, and cognitive decline and brain injury. All of these are examples of biological factors that may be associated with or even causal to mental health symptoms. We also need to think about psychological factors that can be, again, associated with causal to mental health symptoms, such as a person's attitudes, beliefs, cognitions, and cognitive distortions, behaviors and personality characteristics, a person's environment, their social supports, the systems and structures around them, and experiences of things like discrimination that can engender mental health symptoms. And again, all of these types of things tend to be avenues for advocacy and approaching kind of larger systemic issues. In this video lecture, we're going to focus on the biological aspect of the biopsychosocial model. And so I'm going to cover the central and peripheral nervous system, hemispheres of the brain, lobes of the co cortex, the frontal, occipital, parietal, and temporal lobes, the cerebellum and the brainstem, the subcortex and the limbic system, neurons and glia, neurotransmission, and neurotransmitters. Some introductory thoughts for you. The nervous system is highly interrelated, meaning the brain and body work in synchrony with each other. Okay. Messages are sent from the brain to the body and vice versa. While there are regional differences in the brain, okay, meaning that, for example, the amygdala we associate with emotion processing and fear, most functions, memory, emotions, etc., are shared among and between brain regions. And I don't want you thinking that just one section of the brain, one structure of the brain, exists outside of the other structures. It all works in concert, in harmony. The same, by the way, is true for mental disorders. When we see neurological correlates of mental disorders, they tend to be across several regions of the brain. Okay? An example of this would be the frontolimbic network that you see impaired in things like trauma and in depression. Networks play a role, right? In other words, connectivity between different parts of the brain. So you can't learn about the brain and brain structures in isolation from each other, if that makes sense. You have to understand that this thing works holistically. Right? And so we have to learn about it, therefore, as interrelationships. Let's talk about the nervous system and how it's structured. There is the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system has the brain and spinal cord associated with it. The primary neurons here are pyramidal neurons. The peripheral nervous system is made up of the sensory and motor part of the, of the system. And they have their own neurons, sensory neurons and motor neurons. Okay. The goal of the central nervous system is basically for the brain um, to send messages to different, you know, to, to make decisions and such and to receive information to, to send messages through the peripheral nervous system via the spinal cord to engage in things like muscle movement or the release of hormones or things that get you ready for action, things that help you kind of do the tasks ahead of you. Okay, they work together, the central nervous system and peripheral. One of the most important parts of the peripheral nervous system that we'll talk a lot about is the autonomic nervous system, part of the motor system, especially the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches. Okay, what is the autonomic nervous system? Well, it's responsible for the fight, flight, freeze stuff you're familiar with. The sympathetic branch is the thing that ends up with the release of cortisol and adrenaline that gets a person ready to meet the threats in their environment, right? Through fight, flight, freeze. 
and releases things like cortisol and adrenaline, the HPA axis fits in here, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. We'll learn a lot about this subsequently. So it's important just to kind of mention this as being important. The parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system is responsible for recovery from sympathetic activation. What I mean by that is, let's say that you have cortisol and adrenaline flowing on your system. Eventually that needs to be turned off and the person needs to be returning to baseline. Otherwise the person is perennially activated, ready for action. And as you'll see in other lectures, that is not good for us. And so parasympathetic recovery is about calm, soothing that system. And then you have the enteric system, which is often called the gut brain axis. It's uh, basically the, the gut and its relationship to the brain. You may already know that the gut actually has its own neurons, amazingly enough. And so this is also an important part of the peripheral nervous system. And you can see problems with gut functioning related to mental health function. Okay, let's talk about lobes of the cerebrum. Before we do that, very quickly about hemispheres. Right and left hemisphere, they have different functions. They work together in relationship with each other. So for example, you will sometimes read about, oh, I'm right-brained or I'm left-brained. That's not really great. That's, not, that's just pop psychology. Because what often happens is while we may, for example, uh, gather information from our sensory system and in, intu kind of intuit from our emotional system, some ideas about what to do, and then we may make rational choices uh, with the left hemisphere after the right hemisphere get, gathers information, all works seamlessly together to make decisions. And so you should know that about the hemispheres of the brain. Now let's look at lobes of the brain. Again, they all work together. Frontal lobes, temporal, parietal, and occipital. You're most familiar probably with the frontal lobes. This is responsible for the motivation, planning, inhibition, judgment, and, uh, and uh, la uh, language expression of humans. And you see things here such as executive function, right? Making these decisions about what to do in a situation or long-term planning, not just short-term planning, okay? Broca's area is located in this area, language expression, meaning spoken words. The temporal lobe, this is language comprehension, Wernicke's area is in here. A person understands what others have said, they process it in the temporal lobe. So auditory perception is located here as well as smell. It's important to note the positioning here. Think about this as the lobe that's closest to the ears, okay? Then you have the occipital lobes associated with vision and visual processing. So for example, are the things that a person sees in their environment that, that is processed and decisions about that are made in the frontal lobe. So there's still connectivity that has to happen. An example would be, let's say you were driving and you saw a car slow down up ahead the occipital lobes would send a message to the frontal lobes that you needed to slow down, right? Or change lanes, et cetera. Okay, and parietal lobes, this is spatial orientation and somatic and sensory awareness. It may be things like a person's awareness of themselves in space. Sometimes you call that proprioception. It could also be awareness of what's happening within the body, right? A bodily awareness. So for example, awareness of heart rate increasing or muscle tension. There are also two very important structures below the cerebrum that are considered more like, they're like the first things evolutionarily to develop and are, are in some ways more like primitive, like, uh, like crucial structures for survival. So the brain stem is associated with heart rate, breathing, arousal, consciousness, and the cerebellum with balance, coordination, and movement. Okay. And so, and as well as emotional processing, we should also mention that. Um, so uh, creatures, animals, for example, they may not have all the facets of the frontal lobes, but they sure have facets of the brainstem and cerebellum, right, to be able to survive. I'll mention here that if you love zombie movies, usually they'll talk about this in the zombie movies, that you, you may have da damage to the cerebrum, but the brainstem and cerebellum is still alive and kicking, right? That the person can still breathe, walk around. They may not be conscious, per se, you know, of, of the, all the rational thoughts that are happening. Okay, let's take a look at positionality. Positionality meaning here, uh, different like uh, directional ways of understanding the brain. So you have, if something is towards the top of the skull, we call this dorsal. If something is towards the bottom of the skull, we call this ventral. If it is towards the back, we call it posterior and towards the front, we call it anterior. You will hear terms such as anterior cingulate 
cortex or posterior cingulate cortex. And it's helpful to understand where these structures reside within the brain based on this terminology. Now, you, you may want to reference that slide when you go back and forth uh, in the other uh, content that we go through in this course. Okay, let's take a look at the structures of the cortex. First, we'll take a look at the prefrontal cortex, and then we'll look at some other areas around. So the prefrontal cortex is the, probably the area, again, you're very familiar with. We associate this with executive functioning, decision-making. There is the lateral and the medial area. Lateral meaning to the side. Think about the, uh, the very middle of your, um, the very middle of your, uh, of your forehead. And think about uh, that being, if it's at the midline, that would be medial and lateral would be to the side of the, the middle of your forehead, if that makes sense. Okay, so lateral means the side, medial in the middle. Orbital frontal cortex, this is towards the bottom, if you will, of the frontal cortex. And other uh, pieces that we're gonna talk next about are considered kind of sub, they're not quite fully subcortical, but they're, uh, you know, uh, moving more to, inwards to, from the brain, right towards the middle of the brain. And uh, the insula, the anterior cingulate cortex, the posterior cingulate cortex, and the basal ganglia all have very important functions and are often talked about in mental health. The insula, we associate with things like awareness of, uh, of others, of empathy, right, as, as well as awareness of one's, uh, one's own body, interoception. The posterior cingulate cortex is associated with self-referential thought or this kind of thinking about thinking, being aware of what you're thinking about, okay? And has an important role in something called the default mode network that we'll get to in a minute. The basal ganglia is very important because this is known as one of the major dopaminergic pieces of the circuit, if you will, of the dopaminergic system and uh, houses uh, structures such as the nuclear cumbens, very associated with how dopamine is produced and secreted. And when we talk about addiction, we, also talk, we often talk about structures of the basal ganglia. So we've talked about the prefrontal cortex, the insula, the anterior cingulate cortex involved with emotional processing. I didn't mention that one so much. The PCC, posterior cingulate cortex, and then basal ganglia. Note, by the way, the role of the basal ganglia in movement, because you should know that dopamine has not only a role in motivation and reward seeking, but also with movement. Okay, And Parkinson's disease is known as having a deficit for dopamine. And so you often see impairments in the basal ganglia during the, those conditions. I mentioned default mode network. We're going to talk about it next. The prefrontal area, the medial prefrontal cortex, and the posterior cingulate cortex are involved here with default mode. What is the default mode? It's the way in which we engage in, I, I like to call it like um, non-active thinking. I want you to imagine that you're driving home from work and you've driven that road many times and you're not really thinking about work you're or, or even on the road or on the drive ahead of you your thoughts are just just floating around it's almost like you're daydreaming a little bit that inactive you know that non-directed type of thought happens in the default mode network and it's very important to emotional processing however in mental disorders you often see this be dysregulated where a person has difficulty with attention and fo like focusing you know that their thoughts just kind of daydream and meander too much. You see problems in the default mode network with schizophrenia, with autism, with ADHD. And we'll talk more about default mode network later on in the course. Okay, now we're on to more interior again to the brain, more to the center of the brain, the limbic area. You're probably familiar with most of these structures. The hypothalamus and the thalamus you may be less familiar with, so let me cover those particularly. The amygdala, let's get to that one first. This is the seat of emotional processing and fear. Note that other structures too have a role in emotional processing and fear, not just the amygdala. The hippocampus is con very connected to the amygdala because for example, if a person has specific memories of a threatening event, the hippocampus will be able to retrieve them, talk with the amygdala, communicate about this being a threat, and then that sounds the alarm. The amygdala sounds the alarm. So hippocampus, seat of memory, most of you probably know that. The thalamus is the communication center of the brain. We often consider this to be grand central station of the brain where messages get routed to different parts of the brain. So it has a very important role. The hypothalamus also has a very important role. 
is the beginnings of the um, the endocrine system, particularly around things like the HPA axis, the hypothalamic hypothalamus, pituitary pituitary gland, and adrenal uh, medulla and, and cortex adrenal axis, HPA, and that releases things like cortisol, adrenaline. And so the hypothalamus is involved in sending messages to release hormones to different important hormone glands uh, of the brain and body, one of them being the pituitary gland. So let's quickly talk about the HPA axis, since I've referred to it a couple of times. The sympathetic adrenal medullary axis is another corollary to it. Both of these are involved with the release of cortisol and adrenaline. The SAM axis of the hypothalamus sends a message to the adrenal medulla that is the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Both of these, if you're not aware, are either adrenaline or a related cousin of adrenaline, okay, which activates the sympathetic nervous system, gets you ready for action, fight, flight. The HPA axis, similar deal. But what I like on the right side of the graphic is the information about these, we'll call them pre-hormones almost. That's how I like to talk about them. That's not a clinical term. It's just how I like to think of them. The hypothalamus sends a message called corticotropin releasing factor to the pituitary gland. When it's received that message, it itself releases adrenocorticotropic hormone. Try saying that one fast 10 times, ACTH. ACTH then sends a message to the adrenal cortex to release cortisol. So there is a system in place to release cortisol starting at the hypothalamus, okay? Eventually, the adrenal cortex will send a message back up to the pituitary gland that, okay, we've got plenty of cortisol flowing here. You can turn off the tap. We don't need more cortisol. And that leads to parasympathetic recovery. Okay, now that we've learned about the sympathetic uh, branch of the autonomic nervous system, and the HPA axis, which we'll talk more about when we talk about stress and PTSD and anxiety in subsequent weeks, I'm going to turn our attention briefly to ventricles and cerebro cerebrospinal fluid. Ventricles are the gaps that naturally occur within the brain. It is not true that all aspects of the brain are completely jam-packed with neurons. There are actually uh, gaps, if you will. There are um, areas of the brain that, that do not have neurons in them. It's said they have cerebrospinal fluid in them. And what you often see happen in a person who develops uh, head injury, neurocognitive disorders like Alzheimer's, chronic alcohol use, that these, uh, these ventricles, they grow larger. And uh, so in things like uh, PET scans, CAT scans, MRIs, you see these areas as enlarged. And that's problematic because it tells you there's been decline, decline in neur neurons and, uh, and, and what we call volumetric loss. Okay, we've talked about the structures of the nervous system, we've talked about uh, the structures of the central and peripheral nervous system, now we're gonna talk about the cellular level. I think to understand, for example, why we talk about serotonin with depression and such, you need to understand those neurotransmitters and the process of neurotransmission. So we're going to delve into that next. The human brain, which weighs about three pounds, has a composition of two major types of cells, okay? The first are neurons, primary nerve cells, which you're probably very familiar with. What's interesting about neurons is that they have many, many connections with each other, okay? Remember, neurons exist in context. They do not exist alone. You really should only understand a neuron from its relationship to other neurons. And they're a messenger. It's like a messenger cell, really. 10,000 connections. There's a whole lot of synapses, folks, okay? You should also know that children, young children, the age of three, have twice the connection of adults. Adults lose connections through pruning. The reason for that is efficiency, that a lot of those connections are not needed from early childhood, and the ones that aren't used are pruned to make you more efficient, your thinking more efficient. Okay? But that also is part of the reason why it becomes more difficult to learn languages as you age. In addition to those 1 billion neurons, there are many, many more glia, or supportive cells, 500 billion to 1 trillion. So what are glia and what do they do? Well, we'll discover that in just a second. This is the neuron, the nerve cell. The neuron is composed of several important parts or structures. Let's highlight a couple of those. First, you have the dendrites on one end of the neuron. The dendrites have receptors 
those receptors receive neurotransmitters and it's a very important part of neurotransmission. Okay, so the dendrites are receding. The axon terminal buttons on the other end are the senders. Those are the, the parts that send neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. Okay, what happens is when the dendrites receive enough of a certain neurotransmitter and enough, as you'll see, ions enter into the cell, an electrical charge is developed called an action potential. And if it crosses the threshold, that will flow down the, the neuron, down the cell, via the axon to the axon terminal buttons. And then it will stimulate the vesicles that will let, lead to the release of neurotransmitters. I'll have graphics on this coming up. What I will mention here is that the myelin sheath in the middle of the axon that you see there have a very important role in how fast that charge moves through the cell. Without myelin, the charge moves pretty slow. With myelin, it helps a lot with conductance. It moves 5,000 times the speed, believe it or not, right? Huge difference. Myelin is fatty sheath, and, it is, and neurons are not born with this. When a new neuron is developed, they do not uh, exist with fatty sheath that develops over time. And so we call that process myelination, and it's very important to your own cognitive efficiency. When you have new neurons bore, uh, be birthed in your own brain, say it happens tomorrow, a new neuron has popped up, uh, it will not have myelin, but it develops it over time. What I will say is that, uh, that myelination is a very important process because it helps explain why children become faster uh, pro cognitive processes. For example, a baby, if you've ever, uh, an infant, if you've ever watched them try to grab an object, they move very, very slowly, and it's very hard for them to grab it. It's because of the neurons not being myelinated. And what happens over time is they are faster. They, you know, they develop better abilities, the neurons fire more quickly because of the myelin, okay? So myelination, very important process. Very quickly, also the cell body there has within it the nucleus. The nucleus is what contains DNA, okay? And also RNA. Now DNA, I'm sure you know what that is. RNA is what transcribes the DNA into, uh, and, and eventually it's made into proteins. And those proteins have a large impact on the cell's functioning. Okay, so that's how the whole kind of genetics process works within cells. Glia cells, now that I've talked about neurons, they are very important to the support of neurons. They clean up debris and waste from areas of injury and cell death, especially during sleep. They also can be involved in inflammation responses and so assist with reducing or enhancing inflammation depending on what's going on in the brain. They can transport nutrients to neurons that are needed for its own health. And importantly, they hold the neuron in place. So these glial cells have very, very important roles in the neuron, okay? I'll note here that an overactivation in microglial cells is associated with schizophrenia and autism. In post-mortem brain analyses, they found that their alterations in the number, morphology, and in interactions of microglial cells. Morphology means the shape, by the way. And that's important because uh, it's another, these are examples of factors that help explain mental health diagnoses and symptoms, okay? For example, when this occurs, when there's overactivation of microglial cells, it creates problems in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Remember where dorsal is, think about that, look at the graphic. Remember where lateral is, think about that, look at the graphic. So top to, uh, to the side, responsible for, for executive functions, you know, so deciding, for example, what actions to take, thinking about thinking, decision making, those things are impaired uh, because of microglial cells. Okay, now that we've learned about neurons and glia in isolation, we need to now understand how they work together because the function of a neuron can only be fully understood by examining its relationship to other neurons. Just like we learned about with brain regions, brain regions work together, right, in concert, in synchrony. What I'm going to share with you is a time lapse of neurotransmission. I love this video. It's beautiful. And we'll share it with you uh, twice. What I want you to do the first time is just watch what's happening. And the second time, I'll talk through what's happening. 
amazing, right? So you probably noticed that there are white dots moving back and forth. That has to do with action potential, electrical charges moving through a cell. I'll also mention here, this is what we're going to watch for the second time. Take a look at how the axon extends and moves in response to the other neurons. It's amazing, right? This has to do with the concept of neuroplasticity, how these cells are constantly trying to find connections. And the way to understand most neurons is that actually the axon is very, very long and large and helps connect a lot of cells together. And so the uh, in pyramidal neurons being a great example of this, uh, often the, the dendrites can be very long, the axon can be very long. The connections are so important, right? That they're often quite kind of spindly strands of, of, uh, of, of cells. Okay, now let's learn about neurotransmission and what's happening for this electrical charge to occur. You see here the presynaptic neuron and then the postsynaptic neuron. Presynaptic meaning this is the sender of neurotransmitters. Postsynaptic meaning that is the receiver of neurotransmitters. Okay, so what's happening in the presynaptic neuron here is that an electrical charge has flowed down the cell and that polarized charge is a positive charge. If you know your electricity, or your, your basic magnetism, frankly, you know that you need an opposite charge in order for things to attract. The postsynaptic neuron is negatively charged, and so positive and negative attract. They enter into proximity with each other, they attract. And then when that happens, then the uh, then neurotransmitters are released into the cleft, okay, through that electrical charge that's flowed through the presynaptic neuron. Now, what's interesting here is that the synaptic vesicles you see there, those move downwards, or in this graphic downwards, they move towards the axon terminal buttons, the very kind of end of the cell, end of the, the, uh, the dendrite you see there, and they are then released into the synaptic cleft. Okay? Once they're released into the cleft, some of them will bind to receptors, which you see indicated there, on the postsynaptic neuron. Okay? So to, to recap, when two neurons are in proximity, signaling occurs, and that has to do with electrical charge, right? The positive and negative. For example, at something like a calcium, which is positively charged, leads to the opening of presynaptic terminal buttons, okay? Uh, and, uh, and neurotransmitters are released into the synaptic cleft. Why does positive and negative matter for that? Well, this is complicated, but hang in there with me. Remember that negative things attract. So if you have a cell that is negatively charged, it is not going to attract with another cell that's negatively charged. It needs to be positive and negative okay, in order for it to attract together. So once they attract together, you need that positive charge. And then uh, that leads to the action potential and, and, and neurotransmission continuing. Okay? Here are the three potential fates of neurotransmitters. Some bind to the receptor. Some are destroyed in the cleft. They just stay there and they're destroyed by enzymes. And some are reabsorbed back up into the presynaptic neuron in a process called reuptake, okay, received back. For the neurotransmitters that bind to the receptors, what happens there is an indirect process. So I used to misunderstand this actually. I thought that, okay, now the cell receives neurotransmitters and then the action potential occurs. This doesn't work that way. So once neurotransmitters bind to the receptor, it's almost like the key to a lock. The lock opens, and then that door opens for ions to enter. Okay, it's the ions that cause the charge. What are ions? It's things like calcium and potassium, et cetera. Okay? And ions can be positively or negatively charged. If enough positively charged ions enter a cell, it creates a polarized elect electrical charge known as an action potential. If that charge crosses the threshold for charge, then the neuron fires an electrical impulse from the dendrites to the terminal buttons via the axon, right? The charge occurs, okay? I think I've talked about myelination, so I'm gonna move on. You should know that neurotransmission is a complex process and not always predictable because each neuron has thousands of receptors per cell and many receptor types, okay? Thousands of receptors per cell and many receptor types and neurotransmitters can bind to multiple types of receptors and also have different effects based on receptor type, okay? That probably all sounded like gobbledygook, but it will make sense once I go through a couple of uh, visuals here, okay? There are two major types of receptors, ligand-activated ionotropic receptors 
and metabotropic receptors. Okay, these things do different things. The ligand activated ionotropic receptors change in shape when a neurotransmitter binds to it, resulting in a direct opening of ion channels. Okay, so for example, let's say that something like um, let's do let's do uh, glutamate. Let's say that glutamate binds to uh, as which is a neurotransmitter. Let's say it binds to the, a, a receptor that leads to the opening of an ion channel that will receive positive ions. Okay, direct entry. When ion channels open, a positive or negative charge is creating in a cell, depending on whether that that uh, that ch ion channel and the ions that enter are positive or negative. Okay, so that's direct entry. Metabotropic receptors are not direct entry. They do not directly open ion channels. Instead, the receptors trigger another signaling pathway that may indirectly open or close an ion channel. Okay, you'll see this now through uh, some a series of images. So this is ionotropic, right? Ligand activated ionotropic excitatory type. What that means is direct entry, okay? And excitatory, meaning greater likelihood of an action potential. The term excitatory means increased likelihood of action potential. Positive, in other words, positive ions enter the cell, okay? So you see here that I, like, I love to call them hot dog buns. They are, uh, <laughs> they're ion channels. The ion channels open because of a neurotransmitter binding. Okay, and that the, the channels open, and, and then you have a positively charged ion enter into the neuron. Okay, if enough of those ions enter, then you have action potential. You have the same direct entry where a neurotransmitter binds to another uh, to a receptor, and then these hot dog buns, these ion channels open. But this time, the ion channel enters in negatively charged ions. When this happens there is less of a chance of action potential because it is inhibitory. Inhibitory means less potential, less action potential, okay? Because of, remember the opposites, you know, the postsynaptic neuron is going to be negative, so you need a positive charge. Okay, now we have the indirect entry method, metabotropic, the G protein type. There are different types. We just focus on G proteins here. The neurotransmitter, let's say in our example, glutamate, binds to the receptor. But what happens here is interesting. Instead of a message being sent straight to the hot dog bun, right, that opens the ion channel and in come the ions, instead, there is a message sent to a G protein, which I like to call the bra. It looks like a bra to me. I don't know, it just doesn't. So the G protein then decides whether or not the hot dog bun, the ion channel, opens or closes. A, so it's actually possible the G protein closes the ion channel. Right, And so no negative or positive neurotransmitters enter in. It's also possible that it opens the ion channel, but you know, it's, it's not as predictable. Okay? So we've talked a little bit about excitatory effects and inhibitory effects. Uh, ex an example of an excitatory neurotransmitter is glutamate. When that binds, it opens uh, the positively charged ion channel, so positive ions can flow in. And GABA, which has an inhibitory effect, when that is the key to the lock, when that opens the ion channel. The ion channel that opens is a negatively charged one. And so negative ions flow in and reduce action potential. Okay. Now that you've learned that, what's interesting is all of the neurotransmitters you've learned about activate indirect method, metabotropic, okay, on the right hand column. But what's interesting is not all of them activate ionotropic direct entry. Okay, some of them do, some of them don't. For example, dopamine and norepinephrine does not activate direct entry, okay? Whereas GABA glutamate does. But notice the effects are different, right? With GABA, it's inhibitory, right? With glutamate, it is excitatory. So GABA reduces action potential, glutamate increases it. Okay? So we have acetylcholine listed here, dopamine, GABA, glutamate, norepinephrine, and serotonin. We're gonna learn about these neurotransmitters in just a moment. And here we go. Okay, so we're going to learn about each of those that I just mentioned. We'll start with dopamine. The function of dopamine is a couple of different things that it's most well known for. One is, again, motor movement. Um, and you see, of course, problems with Parkinson's with low dopamine. But the other is motivation, reward seeking, executive function, and positive reinforcement that you see with addiction processes, if it's you know, out of whack. Okay? But we get kind of motivated, excited based on dopamine, that it helps recruit attention, right? Re recruit our priorities. 
And it's not a bad thing in and of itself, right? Uh, you know, if we have too low dopamine, we have a motivation. We're not motivated to do things. Related psychopathology is Parkinson's and a motivation, as I mentioned, addiction, but also psychosis. If dopamine is too high, it's also associated with hallucinations. Norepinephrine next, which is actually in the same family as dopamine, by the way. Its functions are more sympathetic response, fight or flight system, right? It's the pre hormone to adrenaline. Norepinephrine is like, uh, remember, remember, epinephrine is the same as adrenaline. So norepinephrine is like noradrenaline. Its functions are the sympathetic response, as I mentioned, attention. Now, why attention? Think of this is very important to talk about just for a moment. When you get activated in the sympathetic system, okay, you get uh, increased blood flow, right? You also, your heart rate increases. You are ready for action in a small amount. If that happens a small amount, you're more alert, you're more attentive, right? You're more ready to face the threats ahead of you. So when norepinephrine is low, you tend to have problems with attention, with concentration. When it is higher, you tend to be more attentive, more alert, okay? So it has, it has more roles in cognitive processing, as well as emotions, sleeping, and dreaming. As I mentioned before, like adrenaline, it's released as a hormone in the blood where it causes blood vessels to contract and heart rate to increase. And related, related psychopathology is ADHD, as you might imagine with attention, and depression. Okay, Why depression? We'll talk more about it when we talk about depression. Okay, catecholamines. You should just know that, as I just mentioned, this flow chart, epinephrine or adrenaline has related cousins of norepinephrine and also dopamine, interestingly enough. right? The dopamine is also a part of these catecholamines involved in sympathetic activation. Okay, let's talk about serotonin next. Serotonin's functions are not just mood related. And that's probably where you're most familiar with serotonin, depression, and you know, I'm feeling down, so I'm gonna eat some chocolate and boost my serotonin. It's not just about that. It's about appetite and sleep regulation. Remember in depression, you tend to see those as the, what are sometimes called vegetative symptoms or neurobiological symptoms, right? There are changes to appetite and changes to sleep. One uh, might argue, by the way, that sleep problems uh, engender depression. There are actually experimental studies where <laughs> they're kind of unethical. They've uh, sleep deprived college students and they all end up depressed okay? because serotonin is important in depression. So serotonin contributes to various functions, regulating body temperature, sleep, mood, appetite, and pain. And related psychopathology is depression and anxiety. I'll note here that Serotonin is an inhibitory neurotransmitter like GABA is, right? And so when it is higher, it's associated with less anxiety, less depression. Whereas when it is lower, you associate this with more depression, more anxiety. Now, and, and why is that? You might wonder. I'll talk about it when we get to GABA. Okay, acetylcholine. This is particularly important with uh, neurocognitive disorders, dementia and delirium. It's related to the regulation of alertness, memory, wakefulness, attentiveness, anger, aggression, sexuality, thirst, and parasympathetic recovery. Glutamate. This is the most abundant excitatory neurotransmitter. Very important. It promotes something called long-term potentiation. What is that? Well, very quickly, we'll talk about it in the slide coming up. Long-term potentiation is the ongoing growth of neurons and synapses. So if we have long-term potentiation, then we have an ongoing growth of neuron synapses and you know, more volumetric increase. Whereas long-term depression is the opposite, is the death of neurons and synapses over time that are not replaced and leads to volumetric decline. Note that uh, long-term depression is not the same as clinical depression. Though to be honest, if long-term depression, depression of neurons is occurring, you're going to see a clinical depression associated with it. Its functions include learning, memory, cell death and regeneration, and depression is related to psychopathology. You may be familiar with S-ketamine, a version of ketamine that was developed that actually has a major role in the glutamate regulatory system. All right, GABA. GABA is the major inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's a metabolite, by the way, of glutamate and is involved in anxiety control and sleep. Just like with serotonin, when GABA is low, you're anxious. When GABA is high, 
you are not as anxious. And the reason for that is I want you to think about the, the way that the, the body works, the sympathetic system, okay? Imagine that the sympathetic system is very active. You associate that with anxiety, right? Increased heart rate, sweaty palms, you know, the adrenaline response. Well, that's an excitatory response, right? That, that's your sympathetic system very activated. What happens is inhibitory neurotransmitters slow that down, stop things like sympathetic activation, right? And so you associate GABA with things like, uh, when it's higher, the slowing down of the sympathetic nervous system. And so controlling anxiety, improving sleep, right? Uh, reducing things like energy, but also concentration and alertness. And so when a person takes something like alcohol, which boosts GABA, or a benzodiazepine such as Valium, or Ativan, or Xanax that boosts SCABA, you associate that with less anxiety, but also impaired concentration, attention, sometimes movement challenges, um, sleepiness, all of those things, because you're suppressing the sympathetic nervous system, if that makes sense. Okay. okay. Melatonin, I think that's one of the last ones. It is a related cousin of serotonin, interestingly enough. You probably are familiar with melatonin because it has a role in sleep regulation. It is produced by the pineal gland primarily. Secretion is influenced by light exposure to the eyes. So, but this helps us with the diurnal rhythm, right? That when melatonin is low, it's because of daylight. And when it's high, it's because of nighttime. It's produced during dark, okay? And it helps us with get, getting prepared to go to sleep, okay? Because we're diurnal creatures. What's interesting is the duration of melatonin secretion each day is proportional to the length of night. And so you'll sometimes hear people who go to places like Iceland who have grand difficulty getting to sleep in the, in the summers there because there's hardly any darkness, right? And so their body is, isn't producing much melatonin. It has a well-established role in circadian rhythm and can be taken over the counter as a supplement to phototherapy, right? To assist with going to sleep. Okay, I've talked about neuroplasticity Kind of as an aside, let's talk about it more formally. You should know that the brain adapts when presented with new information, events, or experiences. We'll talk a lot about this. We talk about stress and trauma. Neurogenesis is the process of growing neurons. Synaptogenesis is the process of pruning connections and ex uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> I read that wrong. Of developing new synaptic connections, and extinction is the pruning of connections. Okay. Over time, if too much pruning occurs and too much death of neurons occurs, you have long-term depression. If you have the ongoing growth of neurons and have synaptic connections, you have long-term potentiation. Okay? And you can guess which one is more functional, which is better, long-term potentiation. It's important to note here with long-term potentiation that there are neurotropic factors, growth factors, okay, such as brain-derived neurotropic factor okay, and glutamate which help with the growth of new neurons and synapses. Okay, in summary, you just went through a lot. You may need to rewatch that, maybe you don't. You learned that neural functioning can only be understood in relationship, in relationship to brain structures and regions in relationship between neurons. You learned that neurons function in a network via electrical charge and communication that neurons are attracted to each other by opposing charge, that neurons are the keys to the receptor locks that then open ion channels, that ions themselves can have excitatory or inhibitory effects based on their charge, and that if enough of a positive charge occurs, the neuron fires, known as an action potential. Over time, with enough charge and firing and need for you know, to the development of synapses, uh, you get long-term potentiation or depression. And that wraps up this video lecture.